Merry Christmas. <sighs> Keep rolling. Want <laughs> me to go? I know that 2023 may have been what some of you had hoped for, and I know for many of you it was not what you had hoped for. I know that a lot of times when we're trying to hold on to hope and life is not going as we expected, it's a difficult thing to do. But one of the things that I love about the Christmas experience and closing out a year, it's a reminder that we serve a God of hope, we serve a God of love, we serve a God that ultimately is there with us through every moment in life. And whether you had some amazing memories in 2023 to celebrate, or the, where you had some really hurtful moments where you were just like glad that this year is over, I just wanna remind you that we serve a God of new beginnings. And as we turn the corner to 2024, we are able to hold on to the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of direction, the God of guidance, the God of vision, that ultimately is always with us through every step of the way. So whether you have a big dream for 2024 or whether you have a small dream for 2024, God is with us every step of the way. And I just wanna encourage you, Hold on to God. Let him be present with you in every step of the way as you get ready to look into 2024. Well, let me give an official good morning and uh, happy new year to all of you, even though I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm the fan of like, I got to say happy new year, like after midnight. Uh, it's just me. It's kind of like, I don't want to decorate for Christmas until after Thanksgiving. I know some of you are like, oh, no, 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 no. That gets done in October. Well, we didn't get it done until December. So, but uh, anyway, it is a great day today and what an exciting day, closing out the year 2023 and stepping into 2024. Um, you just heard a, a short message from our senior pastor, uh, Pastor Moses. If you're new here th with us this morning, my name is Brian. I'm the campus pastor here at South Hills Manhattan Beach. Uh, there's about 12 of us uh, across the globe, most in Southern California. We've got uh, Virginia, Idaho, and Ohio, and then all the way into Kenya. Um, but uh, Pastor Moses leads us as our senior pastor, and uh, we've got a whole bunch of us campus pastors just having fun in our community. So uh, I like to look at it that way. I think of this past year as uh, a true joy. I know that there has been struggles and trials, and I know that some of us in this room, uh, like Pastor Moses just said, are probably going through some deep hurts and struggles from this year but also that this is a new beginning. Tomorrow is a new day. And I want to read some, uh, some, uh, just some statistics to you first so we can kind of get a little glimpse of what New Year's resolutions look like. How many of you have New Year's resolutions? How many of you are like, eh, not me? How many of you have them? Come on. How many of you are like, negative, not me? I'll just know that I'm going to keep, uh, uh, okay, so just, just, you might need to plug your ears in a couple times in this, this service, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, let me read this to you. The most commonly selected New Year's resolution for 2024 is fitness. But you might say, of course it is. Well, no, that contrasts with last year's findings, which was mental health. 62% say they feel pressured to set a New Year's resolution. For women, it's 64%, a little bit higher than men at 60%. We're just fine, right, guys? That's usually our answer. I'm fine. Well, come on. We could use a little resolutions too as well. Uh, overall, 48% of people say improving fitness is a top priority in 2024, while 36% cite improved mental health as a top resolution. Here's something that's really interesting is, is that 55% say physical and mental health are of equal importance. Personally, I believe that they coincide. I believe that they affect each other. I believe that there's so much inner workings between physical and mental health, and even more so when you start talking about spiritual health. 49% plan on using an app, a fitness app, for assisting and sticking to their resolutions. I mean, generally apps are what we use, but the most popular tools, apps, are diet programs, gym memberships, habit tracking apps, Diet and calorie counting apps and meditation apps. Those are the top five that people are using to create and also stick to their goals this year. 86% say their New Year's resolution will have a positive impact beyond 2024. And 20% say they keep themselves accountable when it comes to sticking to their goals. 20%. This is a massive drop compared to last year's survey for which 77% say 
said that they would keep themselves accountable. Well, we don't believe in ourselves this year, I guess. For, for some reason, we have like a lot less faith in ourselves. <laughs> How about you, though? Does, does, does any of it matter? Do you take advantage of New Year's resolutions? Is it kind of one of those things where you're like, mm, <laughs> come on, every year it's the same thing. I can do a New Year's resolution any day. This is not unlike any other day. But I'll tell you this. I, I, I'd, I'd love to, to say that I don't need a resolution. I stay the straight and narrow, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to do all the right things. I mean, come on. I've got New Year's resolutions just like many of you. I've got things that I've been working on for years that I'm like, why can't I just conquer that? How come my consistency or commitment to that is just not what it should be? Love to tell you that I don't care about New Year's resolutions, but at the same time, this weekend, really thinking about it, my wife and I, we talked about a lot of this stuff and kind of what our family wants to set focus on this year and how we want to actually provide more consistency for our family. Because I believe that when, when I tell you about my struggles with the little ones, if I tell you it was a rough week with Alice, who's three, usually it's not her fault. It's our fault. We've got to provide an atmosphere where they feel safe and secure. And consistency usually does that. So we've made some commitments. But I'll tell you, what is great about a New Year's resolution is, is that you know you're going to have a whole bunch of people doing it with you. Maybe not the same thing, but maybe there's a whole bunch of other things that they're trying to conquer. So you can look at the person next to you and be like, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing all right. Oh, I missed a couple of days. I've done every day. Oh, we don't want to talk to those people, right? We're like, oh, come on, we got to have some mistakes here, right? But for most of us, we have some type of resolution coming at the first of the year. And if it's not a resolution, if you don't look at it that way, you might at least look to committing to making some things a little better, making sure that this year was a little better than last year. Yeah, eh, not today. But today, I want to close out this series, this season, and uh, this year by tying a bit of last week's story, the, the birth of Jesus, into next year's focus and how we can truly decide to make this the best year yet, not only in our homes and individually and with our families and our relationships, but also as a church and also as the body of Christ, not just this little church on this little corner, but also as the body, as those who are committed to a bigger picture, to the church as a whole. There's churches all over this town and every other town. And my prayer is, is that this year, God sparks a fire in each and every one of us, and we begin to see change in our communities like never before. Before we jump into some scripture, let me quickly pray. Lord, first of all, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord. I pray that everything that we hear today, everything that we're a part of today is encouraging, Lord. Yes, challenge us in ways we need to be challenged. Lord, we know that we need some change, Lord, but most of all, we need encouragement, God. Encourage each and every one of us this morning, God. Again, bless us, but most of all, we pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to start out by revisiting just a couple scriptures from the Luke 2 story. Luke 2, verses 8 through 10, goes like this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, and we talked a whole lot about the shepherds and what that looked like, and keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now, first of all, I know that last week, many of you might have been here last week, many of you may not, but only in one service I shared a little bit of something, share, somebody shared a story with me, and uh, I, I did say that I'm a big fan of the Charlie Brown Christmas. I don't know if you are, but it's just pretty endearing. When you hear them read it, it's kind of like, oh man, look at this. You know, it's not a Christian show. So you see them read about the birth of Jesus, and it's like, come on, put it everywhere, put it on every channel. I love it, you know. But when it gets to Linus's spot, and Linus reads, he actually reads this part right here. He reads this part. And when he gets to that, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. How, how many have ever seen any type of Peanuts show, any Snoopy, Peanuts, Charlie Brown stuff? You know that Linus doesn't let go of that blanket, right? No, he doesn't let go of that. It's his safety, like it's his little safety item, right? It's his security blanket. Many kids have teddy bears, uh, passies, num-nums, that's what we call as a num-num. 
I know. But you've got kids that have different type of security things that they keep with them. And I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this, but I shared this with one of the services last week. That At that moment right there when Linus was reading that, and he says, do not be afraid, I bring you good news, he drops the blanket. You don't see that in very many of the shows, but he drops it in that moment. And I got to believe that it has to be because that was his security blanket. It has to be because there was a purpose there. It wasn't just because, oh, well, Linus is going to drop his blanket right there. That's a good spot where he can drop his blanket. No, it showed that we don't have anything to fear when it comes to God. When it comes to listening to him, when it comes to what he has for us or what he wants to share for us, we have nothing to fear. The only security we need is him. The only safety we need is him. And you can find that in a little cartoon that's how many years old? Many, many years old. That message is still being played today. I want us to draw our attention to the fact that while everyone's focus is on this little boy, this little baby, while our focus, our focus is on the little baby and the story of Jesus' birth, the story that's meant to be told is about why this baby was born. Because now that Christmas is over, it's back to real life. Just so you guys know, the joy of Christmas is getting taken down on the 6th. Is that the official day now? <laughs> is that the official day when you have to have all your, all your uh, decorations down is the 6th of January? I don't know, but that's when we're going to get all this down. It, but it almost seems that way. All of the, the, the little phrases, peace, hope, joy, they all go away. All of the fun little decorations and everything that, that, that just, just feeds into the spirit of Christmas goes away and the new year begins. The new year begins. And many of us, most of the world, forgets the story they just heard about all month. All season long, it was about Jesus' birth. It was about Christmas. And then all of a sudden, it's gone, and life is back to normal. But check this out here. Colossians chapter 1, there's a few verses I want to read to us. It says this, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. See, I believe there's a connection here today. I believe that God wants us to realize today that the baby represents how we come to him. In the same way that he came to us, in an incredibly humble position, especially when you look at the relativity. You think of the creator of the universe, the God of all creation, this, 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 the, who was and is and whoever will be. This is the, 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 he came down as a baby and decided that, okay, I need to come down and just be a person and deal with all this. I mean, we're talking about a baby that, I know they didn't have huggies back then, but they had some type of diapers. I, I mean, the God of the universe had to be raised as a baby, had to be fed, had to be taken care of. That's pretty humbling. He didn't have to do that. The creator of all things came as a baby, a nobody, only to be crucified. For what? For his love, for his grace, for his mercy, for his miracles. The God of the universe humbled himself in such an incredible way, and he did it all just for you and just for me. How can we possibly repay him? How can we carry out that same mission? See, this baby was the creator of all things in the flesh. It's way more amazing than we give it credit for. It's way more powerful than I think we even look at it for face value. It's crazy to think that this is really a true story. It's not a fairy tale. It's not something that just kind of like, oh, well, <laughs> not sure. I mean, you can go back and watch. There's a, there's a, a, a show called The Star of Bethlehem. You can watch that stuff. Uh, Larry and I were talking about some things that we might do in January or February, talking about the birth of Christ and how much proof they have for that time. It's amazing. And we go, oh, 
the story of Jesus. And we sing away in a manger and we sing Silent Night. And it's amazing. It's such a nice story and it's so beautiful. It brings peace and it does bring hope and it brings joy. But then the season's over and we have to carry on. We have to carry on with the mission that God set before us to reconcile all things to him. It says it there in the scripture. Why was he coming? To bring good news and to reconcile all things to him. We're here to carry out that same mission, just like King Jesus. Yes, he was the baby, but he is the king. See, if you get stuck on the baby, you'll miss out on the king, a savior who will bring good news that will bring joy to all the people. That phrase, good news, is the same in Hebrew as the word gospel. It's just basically the definition. It makes more sense in translation, but means the very same thing. All of it for the gospel. Every bit of it for the good news, the ultimate good news. What is that good news? That we have a Father in heaven that loves us, that wants to reconcile our relationship to him so that we can go and in turn be a light to the world around us reconciling relationships to him. It's actually a simple task when we look at it. It's just a lot harder when we dig into the things in our lives and we realize that tomorrow is a brand new year and we get to make the decisions to change things for the good or for the worse. Or we can keep going the way we are. See, you and I, we're created in the image of the creator. You have a purpose. I have a purpose. He wants to have a relationship with you and watch you transform into the very person he created you to be. And get this, it'll be a blessing to those around you. The church's work is outside these walls. That's where our work is. You know what's also outside these walls? Your home, your family, your job, your calling, your relationships, your community. That's why the church's job is outside these walls. We can come inside these walls and be encouraged every day. That'd be great. And we have groups for some of them that might. Maybe there's different groups that you could come down three or four times a week, but that's not the key. The key is to get out and bring it to the community around us. The key is for us to be encouraged in here so that we can be a light out there, so that we can be filled on Sunday, take it with us outside, pour it out of us and be filled again the next Sunday. Or maybe filled every day when you're doing your studies or your devotionals. Many of us might just come on Sundays and the week gets by us. Some of us are very devoted to our relationship with God. Some of us have devotional time every morning, prayer time every morning, and others are saying like, oh man, that's a lot. Like I forget to pray when I get to my meal. We're all in very different places, each and every one of us. But God has a calling on all of us together. Listen, I loved seeing how many people were here last Sunday. We had over 400 for the Christmas Eve services. It was amazing. It was incredible. And that will continue if we build the church outside these walls, beyond Sunday. See, the church didn't have a building for almost 300 years. The first century churches... 250 some years, there was no building. There was no church. This, we were the church, the body. The people were the church in homes, in communities. They were doing whatever they could to share the message of Christ. You know what they were able to do without a building in those years? Let me tell you. First of all, the early church was multiracial and experienced a unity across ethnic boundaries that was startling in those times. Startling in those times. We think that today we have a lot of division. Back then it was just kill or be killed. It was wars. It was you were the enemy, you were the enemy. There was no just let's make reconciliation, let's make this happen. Listen, the fact that tongues broke out for the very reason of so many different languages represented in Acts 2 when the church was first begun shows that it was not normal that that many different groups would be together and sharing the same common vision. Jesus made all people equal and that was unheard of. So naturally, what does that do? It creates unity, community, and security. We could use that today, yeah? I believe we could. You know what else the church was famous for? The early church was a community of forgiveness and reconciliation. 
consequences were a little bit more abrupt back then, wouldn't you say? And we hear about people being stoned. I mean, we, we hear some of, the, some of those old laws are still in effect. Some places where if you steal, you can get a hand cut off. I mean, it's a little different than here. Now we're kind of getting slapped on the wrist and even worse. Oh, well, it's not that bad. Go ahead. Just don't do it again, okay? I mean, we're, we're, we're in a tougher time in some ways, but you look back then and you think, wow, I don't think we'd be able to live in that. I don't think we'd be able to handle that. Jesus introduced grace like never before. Imagine what kind of freedom that brought to the oppressed people of the early church. They were oppressed, extremely oppressed. I mean, I think of some of the third world countries that you see documentaries on and how they have to live and it's so hard, it's so difficult, and we complain about the smallest things here. And I, I watched a couple this week and I was, it broke my heart. I watched one on Guatemala and I thought, gosh, man, what can I do? Don't send me on a missions trip because then I'll, I'll, I'll be stuck there and i got to go do something there because every time I see something that is a need, I'm like, Lord, what can we do? But it still sits out there being a need. There's so much that we could do. The last thing is the early church was famous for its hospitality to the poor and the suffering. Now listen, I think it's a misconception that Christians don't do enough for the needs of this world because most of the boots on the ground aiding in relief and social services are Christian groups. They're Christian groups founded on Christian beliefs. 60% of the world's top philanthropic organizations, the top 10, are founded on biblical principles and Christian beliefs. So, yes, the church, yes, followers of Christ are doing a lot, but we can do more. We need to do more. I'm preaching the choir. I, 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 I do believe that not only do most of us already know this, but most of us have been trying to lean into doing more, giving more, finding a way to be more of a blessing to others around us, finding a way to add value to relationships, finding a way to be a better father, husband, wife, mother, brother, sister, son, daughter, whatever it is. Most of us are trying, but it seems like life just gets in the way. You hit roadblocks, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Life comes at you in one way or another, and, and you lose focus, and you go, okay, well, it seems like life just begins to happen unless we intentionally plan for it not to happen that way. See, I want to commit to what God has for me in every single area Man, I just got a lot on my mind. I, that's a pretty normal, pretty good excuse. To me, that sounds like most of us. It's a lot going on right now. I want to focus on more things, I, but I feel like I can't add anything to my life right now. Well, maybe it's not about adding. Maybe it's about getting rid of some things. Maybe it's about letting go of some other things so you can put the right things into place. Many of us in this room have been in church for a bit now. Maybe some of you are brand new. Maybe today's your first day, some of you. But, and I know, I, I know there's some that say, man, I, I don't know much about Christianity at all. But I believe that because we were created in His image, there's that DNA in there that ultimately knows something's missing. You can talk about the, the God-shaped hole or whatever it is. There's something missing in our lives until we connect with Him, until we reconcile to Him, our Creator. Something's missing without Him. So there's this truth in there that's waiting to be discovered, waiting for God to come in and reveal it to us. But either way, listen to this. Hebrews chapter 5, just a couple of verses says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Hmm. Uh, I don't think of this verse or these two verses as pointing to any one of us individually. I believe that this verse is a good verse for the church as a whole to look at. For the body of Christ... The church as a whole for us to look at and say, you know what? 
Yes, we've heard a lot of it most of our lives. And even if you're not a believer, if, even if you're someone who says, well, I believe, but I'm, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I'm not, I don't know that I'm there yet. Even if you're not, you've heard a lot of the stories of the Bible. You've heard a lot of what's happened in those times. We know a lot, but I believe that it's getting back down to the very basics, the very foundation of who we are as Christians that will change the community around us. The very basics of Jesus, looking at that baby and seeing that that baby was not just a baby. He was the king. He was the ruler of all things. He was the creator of all things, and he has a mission for each and every one of us. It's the same mission overall, and we have different giftings and different callings to carry it out. We need to be a part of a community that supports, loves, and encourages each other. That's what Jesus instructs us to do if we're in his family. I got two objectives for us this morning. Connect to the family and commit to be healthy. It's pretty simple. These are biblical principles. And you could even call them commands. The Bible says he is returning for a spotless bride, or in other words, a unified church, one that's doing what he asked, connected as a family, connecting with each other, caring for and loving on each other. And really, the more we put into action, the more we put ourselves in healthy positions, creating room for true spiritual, mental, and physical health. The better you feel in here, usually, the better you feel, right? It's kind of one of those things when you get dressed up to play basketball or you get dressed up to play a sport, and you want to put on the best, right, because you look good, you feel good, you're like, ha, I feel good, I'm going to do good. I play better that way. You don't play better that way? That's a, that's, a, that's a definite thing. When you feel good in your head and you feel good all around, then you actually start to feel good everywhere, you start to do a little bit better. It's just mind games. It just starts in here. But God knows that, and that's why he says it's about transforming our minds. It's about starting from the beginning in us. When we commit to God's principles, he commits to his promises. He promises he will never leave or forsake. He will provide everything I need according to what? His riches and glory. He will give me answers when I need them. In fact, he says, anyone who lacks wisdom, ask, and you shall surely receive it from your Father in heaven who will freely give it. Listen, we can count on God when we commit to his principles. When we don't commit to the cause of Christ, we can count on the consequences. And we don't have to look far. If you're not happy with the world today, commit to change it. If you're not happy with what's happening in the world around you today, commit to change it because the only reason we're in the position we're in is because a few generations past decided not to. I believe that wholeheartedly. I don't know where. I'm not sure. And it doesn't matter. Only matters today, here and now, that we as the church have a cause in front of us. We can change the world. Not by getting out there and yelling at them, telling them to change. By getting out there and being a light. By loving on, caring for, showing the grace and mercy that Jesus brought. Bringing unity together like never before and caring for those in need like never before. That's our mission. I believe that we have the answers. We just need to figure out the applications. This year, I commit to you to apply everything we talk about here on Sunday mornings to beyond Sunday and to the community around us. They're in desperate need, and we have the hope. Even just physically, our communities, you may not live in Manhattan Beach, maybe you live in a different city, maybe you live in something adjacent, maybe you live a few miles away. Whatever city we're in, we are called to be a light in that community. And we just happen to be here on this corner in Manhattan Beach, so we're going to be a light to the community. If this city needs somebody to clean something up or to fix something or do something, why aren't we the ones stepping into that? Why aren't we the ones ready to serve as soon as a need arises? And there's many of us, so that doesn't mean that you have to be there for everything. It just means that as a body, we collectively come together and commit to the cause of Christ. Commit to the message of the story of Christmas beyond a baby Jesus to the king that we serve today. Listen, I'd like us to do something this week. Maybe it's later today before the new year. 
Maybe it's tomorrow as you start the new year. But schedule 10 minutes or a few minutes of solitude this week. During that time, ask God to prompt you with changes or goals that he wants you to prioritize in 2024. They don't have to be New Year's resolutions. Just making sure that we're prioritizing what he has in front of us and write down what comes to mind. Just a few minutes. This is a good time to pray and see if maybe God answers. We've talked about that a lot. I know that many of us in this room feel like, man, you, you think, would God really talk to me? Like I'm going to pray and then all of a sudden I'm going to hear his voice? No, maybe not. But maybe you'll feel an impression. Maybe you'll know that that thing that you've been thinking or that thing that you've been going through over and over in your mind, maybe you'll get that answer. Maybe you'll feel confident in what it's supposed to be. Maybe he'll give you wisdom on how to handle a relationship. Maybe he'll give you the answers on how to reconcile something that's been broken for so long. We're just asking to take a little time to see what goals are there. But see, God will use that time to do whatever it is that he knows what's best for us. Take a moment. Take some time. Ask God, what should I change? What should I do this year in my life? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you again for your grace and your mercy and your kindness, Lord, that many of us might think that you're just waiting to judge us and to tell us what we're doing wrong so that you can correct us and punish us. But Lord, that's just not true. You're waiting, arms open wide, ready to embrace us no matter what happens. When we fail, it's the best time for your strength to be seen. When we're weak, is the absolute best time to show your strength, God. It's all about you, Lord, and I pray, God, that this morning, each and every one of us would take that focus, starting this year, that we would focus on you and focus on what we can do best to serve the mission. Lord, many of us don't quite understand the effects of serving you, the effects of truly giving our lives over to you, Lord, but there's also a good handful of us in here, Lord, that have done our best to commit and seen your faithfulness and seen the reward. And my prayer is, God, that we can encourage each other that, Lord, you have something so great on the other side of just living a life that reflects you. Lord, bless each and every person here, God, but most of all, we pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, it's going to be a, a fun January. Uh, let's check out what's coming for us this month. They're happy about it. That's all we need to know is they're happy about it. It's going to be a good month. I'm excited about it. Uh, I encourage you to invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite those around you that uh, maybe just might need a little bit of encouragement. Maybe they just need a little bit in their lives. Um, bring them here. Bring them here this month. Bring them with you. Uh, the idea is do less to accomplish more. Uh, many of you live this out through your sacrificial generosity every week. And I just want to say thank you so much for your support this year and for giving to what God is doing. Would you stand with me as we finish up? Thank you again for your giving. And I know that God has something for each and every one of us. Some of us, it's been a struggle this year. Maybe financially it was a struggle. Well, our prayer is that God blesses us in those areas of lack so that we can begin to give more, so that we can take care of those around us, so that we can be a blessing to those in need. And many of you are already reflecting that, but my prayer is for those who have been struggling as well, that Lord... Open the doors that need to be open. Open the windows that need to be open. And God, begin to bless your people, especially as we step into generosity and step into caring for those around us. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, 
Bless each and every family represented, each and every individual person, God. Every relationship represented, every home, every job, every finance. Lord, I pray, God, that you would begin to work in us your principles, Lord, in every area, Lord, from our physical well-being, our mental, our spiritual, and even our financial, Lord. Work within us, Lord, to, to know what's right for us and our families and our homes and what you're calling each and every one of us to do individually, Lord. Again, bless every home, every family represented, every person, Lord. But most of all, we pray that you are blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gift and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.